and we're going to be covering the chapter this morning. The title of the message is, True Worship Works Every Time. True Worship Works Every Time. And we're going to read, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, starting from verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like the sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast and over the image and over the mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, and for all nations shall come and worship before you, and your judgments have been manifested. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure, bright linen, and having their chest girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven bowls, golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. But we also thank you for your power, God. And we thank you that you are God and you're a righteous and true God and that you want to do us good, Lord. And all who call upon you will be saved. And all who trust in you will be restored. And Lord, we thank you for... Uh, giving us wisdom through the book of Revelation. And you did say in Revelations 1-3 that there's a special blessing for those who read this book. And we ask for that special blessing this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the book of Revelation is stating that God has a beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. It means that there's a conclusion. And every good story... A novel needs a good conclusion. But God is the author of life. He's the author and the finisher of life. And so he is a God of time. He's a God that, you know, brings things in the, the whole, our whole calendar is based upon the rotation of the earth around the sun. In other cultures, it's around the moon. Uh, and, and other cultures combine both. But everything's based on 24-hour periods. God is a mathematical, awesome God. Amen. And he has every good intention in our life. That's the book of Revelation, though, is stating that there is an end. And he wants us to fear him, love him, trust in him. But there is going to be a set year tribulation where the wrath of God is going to be poured out on those who will not believe in Jesus Christ and they will have to go through the tribulation. But in the tribulation that's coming very soon, we all feel it, we all see it, we all discern it, you can't, annoy, you can't avoid it. It's all around us the prophecies are coming to pass and so for us we're saved. We're in Jesus. We have nothing to fear. He's coming. He's coming for his, his bride. He's coming for his church. And at just the right time, he's taking us out. Why? Because we trust in him. Why? Because we've been purchased with his blood. And because he's good. But it is a warning to get our lives right with God. 
Now, in the book of Revelation, it's also showing all of the character and attributes of God. Because we went through the first seven trumpets that sounded, and that's why it's so important that we go over Revelation and go over it again. Because there is a lot of misinformation about Revelation. Revelation, in the first half, a third of the earth is destroyed. The first half, a third of the water systems, potable water systems, are destroyed. A third of the oceans are destroyed. A third of the trees are destroyed. A third of humanity is destroyed. 2.7 billion people are killed in the first half of the seven years. 1,260 days, 42 months. And then the second half, it gets worse. But God is stating, and all along... All along, God has his two witnesses there proclaiming for three and a half years. Then he has 144,000 dynamic Jewish witnesses that are proclaiming Jesus to the ends of the earth. And then they're martyred. God is going to be saving in the midst of the tribulation. But it's going to be a very miserable time. And so I have a, a joke for you right now. My son sent me this, so it's kind of fun. Here it is. What did the buffalo say to his son when he left for college? He said, bye, son. Bye, son. Buffalo. It's a buffalo. So buffalo is a bye. <laughs> it's one of those dad jokes, you know. It's like, But the reality is, is we kind of got to lighten up a little bit because... <laughs> The reality is that if we trust in Jesus and honor him, we're not going to be buffaloed. Do you know what to be buffaloed is? Is that a lot of times people don't understand that, you know, we homesteaded, our, our forefathers homesteaded in North Dakota and Minnesota. But there were these millions and millions of buffalo. And if you got buffaloed, you don't survive. Because when they start running... And they, they trample everything in sight. So just they could not cohabitate together. So the buffalo had to be thinned down so that the land could be occupied and farmed, you know. So, but what happens is in stampedes, people get buffaloed. And what happens in the world when people go by their emotions and their feelings and, and everything, they get buffaloed. They get trampled. But God preserves us with his word he gives you discernment he deals with you and i as individuals so special so unique before god each one of us he communicates with us we're, we're his own creation each one of us we're not just a part of a big clan we're a part of jesus individually but we're part of his glorious body but what's happening is is in what we see all around us are end time signs. Just evolution alone has, has literally, there's a school called the Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology, and they're teaching that mankind originated in South Africa, and that 100,000 years ago, men uh, mated, you know, with, um, with uh, uh, what are they? Here it is. I got to. They, they made it with the, um, the original, uh, you know, creation. So in other words, it's, everybody say it's confused. Because earth only goes back 6,000 years. And that God made man in his image. And there is no such thing as evolution. Is that we're made, originally God created us. And he created us in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is round, around where the Tower of Babel is. It's right there in Iraq. We fought a war there. It's right there in Iraq, the Tower of Babel, Babylon. It's all there. That's, the, that's the, where humanity came from. And so if they're teaching that man originated in South Africa hundreds of thousands and millions and billions of years ago, it's hard to base anything on that. It's hard to build anything with that. Is that God is saying that I made you so special in my image, male and female. And you have special attributes that only you can fulfill. 
But when we get this teaching in, in public schools, it, it diminishes confidence. And so we see it in the educational system. We see it in the economic woes that we have. Worth $35 trillion in debt as a nation. $35 trillion. There's many nations that their GDP isn't a trillion dollars. It's far from that. So in other words, we're, we're in trouble economically, and uh, we're in trouble as a nation. We've got, you know, political corruption. We have drugs flowing into our country. We have enough fentanyl in America that could kill the world that's coming over the border. It's just that there's signs around us, the persecution, the blasphemy that occurred at the Olympics. But by the way, that even though they wanted to blaspheme at the Olympics, there were many that were glorifying God at the Olympics. I love uh, Cindy McLaughlin. She's so on fire for God. And she testified how she overcame. And she ran that 400 meters, the hurdles. And she, she just, she was so confident. She was so prayed up. You just see her countenance. It's, it's inspirational. And when she ran, she ran with the, for the glory of God. And she broke her own world record. And she gave glory to God. So in the midst of where maybe mankind or, or the upper elites are trying to mock God, there's others who are glorifying God and not being buffaloed by this world or, or stalled by this world. So the book of Revelation is a group of the tribulation saints. Everybody say tribulation saints. They're tribulation saints because they lived in the tribulation. That's what God's talking about here. He's talking about these that were left behind. They got saved in the tribulation. They, they, were, they were killed. They were hunted down. They starved. They went through all these horrendous things. They were put to death for their faith. But now they're standing on this sea of glass before heaven. And they're victorious. There's no more suffering. There's no more starvation. There's no more sickness or pain. It's that they're standing now in total victory and they're giving praise to God because worship will always work. It's going to work down here. It's going to, it works in heaven. It works when you're in your car. Amen. Worshiping God. It's worshiping God when you're out with nature. Worshiping God as you're walking along the street. Acknowledge God, our dependency upon Jesus. Acknowledge his name. It's a lifestyle of worship. And that's what these tribulation saints are, are declaring, is that they, they, are, they are in their whole now. They're together now. They're with God now. Whenever we're with God, we get it together. Whenever we acknowledge Jesus, it comes together if we give ourselves over to fear and, 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 and we, get, we get involved in what the crowd is doing, then we get, we get trampled or we get weakened. But when we get refocused and we get back in touch with Jesus, he's the author and finisher of our faith. He's in control of history. History was written for him, for him, for his glory, not the glory of man, not the glory of kings, for him. And, and we, we enjoy as believers giving glory to God, because that's where we're made whole. So in verse 2, they're standing on this sea of glass, and they're singing two songs, and it's so amazing. They're, they're singing the song of Moses. So some of the old hymns are coming back <laughs> and in heaven. There's going to be new songs and old songs, but they're singing the song of Moses. And what was that? That was in Exodus 15. And, and Miriam's with her tambourine, the sister of Moses, and the horse and the rider was thrown into the sea. The world-class army, right? They were the toughest and strongest. They had the best chariots and horses, and it was crushed. God crushed the world army because they hated God and because they would not heed his word. So it's a, it's, a, um, it's a message. The song of Moses is that they were once slaves, but God delivered them, and they're singing this song in heaven on the sea of glass. Amen, that God delivers his people. And he delivers us and from Babylon and the worldly system. We talked about that last week. And, and then there's a, there's a song of the Lamb, the song of the Lamb. Do you know how many times the Lamb of God is mentioned in Revelations? 29 times. The Lamb of God. 
God, he's so powerful. He made, he made the universe, he said, and he created the stars. But he's willing to be called the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God, that, that bah, the, the Lamb, the gentle Lamb. See, we want to know him in his gentleness. We want to know him in friendship. Sometimes, in, in the morning, I just always, you know, say the Lord's Prayer after I prayed, you know, a good long time. And then I just, I say, thank you, God, that I know you. You're the king. You're the God. You're the captain of my salvation. <laughs> but you're my friend. And I can call you my friend confidently. Wow. God, you're so awesome. And that's available to all believers. But he is the awesome king. He's the Lamb of God. And so they're, they're singing this song of Moses. And they're singing because they came out of this seven-year horrendous ordeal. And that's why we can also sing and rejoice that we don't have to go through the seven-year tribulation. Amen. Is that God said, I'm going to cut those days short. He said, I'm going to deliver you from all these things and you'll be able to stand before the Son of Man. It's just understanding the times, the dispensations. We're not under the wrath of God. We're under the grace of God. That's that the church age is the grace of God, the age of grace. But it will come to the end at the, at the rapture. And then it's the seven years is God's final judgment on the devil. Don't you want to see the devil judged? For all he's done, that liar, that thief, that murderer, that corrupter. I want to see him judged. And also all those that take his mark and all those that aren't willing to surrender to God, even under so much opportunity, there has to come an end of evil. And that's what is happening in the book of Revelations. So when we worship God... The, we're we're going to learn some principles. There's there's a, a Hebrew word a word called shaka, which means to humble ourselves before the Lord, worship God. It means to kneel before God or to be prostrate before God. You know, it's it's good sometimes at at home to. If God leads you, but you know you want to get God's attention, it doesn't have to be all the time, but sometimes it's good to just kind of lay out before the Lord when you're by yourself and, God, I need you. Amen. I'm desperate for you. But that's, that's another form of the word worship. It means to, to lie out before the Lord. And then when we think about worship, we think about sometimes in, in church history. Do you know that there were wars fought because of church hymnals? In Christian history in Europe, they fought wars over hymnals, literally wars over liturgy, over, uh, over sometimes, you know, creeds. I like the Apostles' Creed. Well, I like the Nicene Creed. Let's go to war about it. And they did. But we got, we got to laugh now. But they missed it. They missed what worship was about. They missed what the creed was about. It's about knowing Jesus. It's about demonstrating Jesus, his love. It's, it's, it's dependency upon God. So it says in John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, we learn how to worship God. It's, not, it's singing as a part, but it's our heart harmonizing with God and singing his song. His song that we, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So we're just going to go over some, some principles of worship that we find here. And um, A.W. Tozer said this. He said, worship is to feel in your heart and express in some appropriate manner a humbling but delightful sense of admiring awe and astonished wonder and overpowering love in the presence of the most ancient mystery, that mystery which philosophers call the first cause, but which we call our Father who is in heaven. Amen. It's, it's deep. It's majestic. It's awesome. And we get to worship him in spirit and in truth. No intrusion. 
We don't want anybody invading our first love relationship with God. Amen? The devil always wants to come in with some imitation, some other thing, some other form, dilute it, water it down. No, we want Jesus, amen, to worship him and worship him in spirit and in truth. So number one, worship him because of his works. It says in verse 3, great and marvelous are your works. The works of God. When you see in Hubble space, you know, the, the space telescope, and now you've got James Webb, and they get more galaxies and more beautiful pictures of the galaxies that God has made. He made that in an instant. The, the swan nebula and, and the, the garment, you know, the, the garment that comes down and these solar flares that we just experienced because of, you know, they were having it in Idaho and different places that normally don't see the northern lights. It's just gorgeous, you know, lights and variation. But God's past works and God's present works and God's future works is that God is working and he's working for our good. And so these tribulation saints are experiencing that in his uh, standing at the throne. Can you imagine the joy, the security of what they came out of? And now they're standing so secure on that sea of glass in just perfect harmony, perfect peace, and perfect love. And, and, but yet we can experience that when we, when we tune out because we're a dual citizen. We're a citizen of heaven. And we're a citizen of this world. We're a citizen, a United States citizen. We might be working on it or we might have a citizenship of another country. But the reality is we're a dual citizen. This is just temporary down here. But we have an eternal citizenship in heaven and we just need to, you know, glory in that security. Amen. I remember in Holland when we were missionaries there and we were working on our visas, there was one year that we had to live illegally in Holland. We were Ill illegal citizens in Holland. But we, we were waiting on our visas and we were working with a lawyer and we were called of God. I'm pastoring a church, leading people to the Lord. But we had to wait on our lawyer to get our citizenship and we got it. We got our Dutch citizenship like a green card. But for one year we had to live illegally. But we were under God's blessing. And, and so many times in this life, we are citizens of the eternal kingdom. Amen. And we work on our citizenship down here, and, and, and we make it as secure as we can, but we have security for sure in heaven. All right, so great and marvelous are his works, his work in creation, his work in illumination. You know that we have the word of God. You have, you have the perfect you have the perfect manual before you, the Bible. 27 books in the New Testament. 39 books in the Old Testament. If you study how it took the forefathers and the scholars to come to those decisions, it's miraculous, but it's harmonious. It's 40 different authors were written over a period of 1,500 years. And in that, you know the origin of life. You know the meaning of life. You know what will happen in the afterlife. And it's all 100% true. You don't need anything more or less. You're illuminated by the word of God. And so also his work of redemption, it's marvelous works. He's made it available through his blood. His blood cleanses us from all sin. Oh, but I've done this and I've done that. No, he's cleansed us from all sin. And he just wants us to receive that. Oh, no, 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 but I got to work. On, I, I got to do some. I got to I got to crawl on my knees for, you know, for 24. No, you're forgiven because of the blood, not because of anything you've done, not because of who you are, not because of your family, not because of where you were born. You are forgiven and loved because of the blood. So it's marvelous in his works. And he's delivered us. Number two, worship him because of his character. He's just and true are all his ways, it says in verse 3. Just and true in all of his ways. But we say, Lord, but why did this happen? And, and why did this work? 
never have to happen. I, I prayed on Cow's Mountain with a neat sister who, Hannah, who has family in the Ukraine. And she said, will you pray, Pastor, for my country and my friends? And of, of course, Hannah, we will. Why did that happen? It happened because of corruption. It happened because of greed. It happened because man will not submit to God and be at peace with himself. So he has to war on others. And it's a personality of Satan. But there's things. We live in a fallen world. And if we're not careful, we'll take up the bitterness of the enemy. We'll start questioning God. God, why did this happen? And why did that happen? And all of a sudden, we're at, at war with God. And that's, that's why people do sometimes the things that they do. They're at war with God. And, they, and then they don't see God's goodness and kindness. And then they end up destroying their lives and their family and others because they're at war with God. When we need to just surrender that God is God and he will work everything out perfectly. Look at these tribulation saints. They didn't listen. They went into the tribulation, yet God saved them. He sent a witness to them. And now they're standing in perfect peace and wholeness at the throne of God. It worked out, but they went through a hardship. Number three, worship him because of his power. Verse three says, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? He's the king of the saints. Now, fear means in awe and exceeding reverence. An exceeding reverence. And it's so true that the fear of the Lord, we depart from evil. It's so true. I'm so glad my mom just put that in me. The fear of the Lord is depart from evil. And sometimes I got irritated with it, but it was in my gut. It was in my heart. And so... It's true. If you fear God, and we all will stumble and bumble around and make dumb decisions, but you learn that it's better to fear God. It's better to do the things God says rather than pay the consequences of our folly. And that's just life in learning. But just think if we're in reverence of God and, and worship Him. He's not just one of the boys. He's not the big boss man. He's not the old man upstairs. <laughs> His name is holy. His name is honored. His name is the name above all names. He's almighty God. And almighty God came down for us. Jesus Christ. And he died on the cross for us so that we would know his love. So number four, worship him because of his sovereignty. In verse four, it says, For thou art only holy, for our nation shall come and worship before thee, the saints worship. Okay, so all the nations are going to come before him. Now, if you know in the book of Revelations, Revelations 20, and we'll be there in a few weeks, but... It, he literally will call those that are in hell to come up and worship him at his feet. And then he's going to send them back to hell. But everyone will be worshiping him. And the Bible says that in Philippians 2, 10 and 11, thou, it says, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that means that everybody, even though they said, you know, they thumbed their nose at God and, and went to hell in judgment, he, they will be called up and they will worship before him before they're sentenced forever. But... Praise the Lord. That's not our case. But that's why the rebel, you know, uh, be a rebel no longer, right? And, and, and learn how through, through our mistakes to worship God and, and to learn his ways because his ways are eternal. And they learn the song of the Lamb, the song of the Lamb. And we want to see the gentle side of God, the loving side of God, and not the wrath of God. And so, 
Number five, worship him because of his judgment. It says in verse four, thy judgments are made manifest. And so God has shown his judgments. And knowing the Bible, I was, my wife and I were, were, were watching this documentary on Noah's Ark, and it sounded so good. And they were getting right to you know, where Noah's Ark National Park is, and, and it's, it, that's where Noah's Ark is. And then all of a sudden, the commentators got this kind of skeptical, mocking voice, and he says, but we don't have any evidence of the flood, but this is what we know. And it's like, oh, come on, evidence of the flood. Seashells on 10,000-foot mountains all around the world. 15,000-foot mountains and seashells up there. What are seashells and crustaceans doing up there? It's because the earth was covered with water. And he doesn't have any evidence. But, but, you know, it's like, come on. The earth was judged. Adam and Eve were judged. They were sent out of the garden, out of their perfect life. The great flood in Genesis 6 through 8, the earth was judged. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, many people have forgotten that. They were judged because of their, their gross immorality and the confusion. And God said that this must be judged. And so it was. Abraham pleaded with God. And God said, if you could find ten Ten righteous Lot. Ten with Lot and his family. I won't judge Sodom and Gomorrah. But they could not find ten righteous in these mega cities. It just shows how sin begot sin and it corrupts and it had to be judged. And so the destruction of the Egyptian army, we talked about that. And also... We need to re remember that Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin. The wrath of God came upon him. He took our sins upon himself. And so we don't have to be under the wrath of God. Now, what's going to happen in the next chapter is that the wrath of God is going to be poured out. Remember, a third of the earth has already been destroyed. Now another third is going to be destroyed. And this is what's going to happen when the bowls are poured out. The seven bowls. The first plague was horrible sores that broke out on those who had the mark of the beast. Horrible sores. The second plague affected the sea. It became like blood of a corpse. And everything in the sea died. Remember the first half? Only a third of the ocean is destroyed. Now the second half? All of the ocean is destroyed. It affects, um, affects the fresh water, the rivers, the springs, and become blood. The fourth plague caused the sun to scorch everyone with its heat. The fifth plague affected the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. The sixth plague dried up the Euphrates so that the kings of the east could march with their armies towards the west. The seventh plague then will be the angel who poured out this bowl of judgment in, in the air. And then look at verse 8. It says, the temple was filled with smoke and the glory of God from his power and no one was able to enter the temple till the seventh plague's of the seven angels were completed. So it is finished. But we have to see that this is the wrath of God. We don't have to be here. We're not going to be here. If you choose, just worship God. Amen. Let's love God, love one another, and, and, and lovingly tell other people that, you know, it's a wise thing to get your life right with Christ, but it's good motivation. But we're seeing here is that this wrath is being poured out. Now, and we're not here. But don't you feel for those that are going to be left behind? I mean, that's why we need to have a compassion to live a good life and to be a good witness and live an abundant life, but also, you know, help others to, to come out of this deception and not be buffaloed by this world. But there's a song, and I'm going to tell you it was written by Augustus to Plady, and it's the song that goes, 
Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Well, he was in this terrible storm up in the mountains. And it was just as the thunderheads were coming over. And, and he knew that he needed to run to the cleft of the rock. And so he, he, he had been in that place before. So he ran. He got under the shelter of the rock, like a rock cave in the cleft of the rock. And then the earthquake, not an, I'm, I'm talking, it wasn't an earthquake. It was thunder. It was, it was lightning. It was torrential rain was falling down upon him. But he was hidden in the cleft of the rock. He, he didn't feel any of it. He felt the warmth and he felt God's protection in the cleft of the rock. And so that's where he got the hymn, the song, you know, uh, Rock of Ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. And so he has always been the one where we run to in the place where we have safety today, tomorrow, and forever. And we, um, but we know God and we respect him. We know his works, his character, his power, his sovereignty, his judgment. Warren Wiersbe, in conclusion, says he defines worship as the believer's response to all that they are, mind, emotions, will, and body, to all that God is and says he does. So worship is a full surrender uh, to his lordship. So let's all stand together and we're going to come to the Lord in prayer.